Number 10, Three Jokers. Thanks to Batman's time on the Mobius chair during DC's Dark Side War event, Bruce discovered that there are apparently three Jokers running around Gotham City. This led to the Three Jokers story from 2020. Three crimes were committed on the same night, seemingly all by the Joker. Alongside the Bat family, Batman discovers that these crimes were committed by the three different Jokers that he learned about. The original Golden Age Joker, known as the Criminal, the Killing Joke Joker, known as the Clown, and the Silver Age Joker, known as the Comedian. Jason Todd, Barbara Gordon, and Batman himself all team up to go after each Joker one at a time, and as you might expect, it doesn't nearly go that smoothly. This is one of the best Joker stories in recent years. It almost feels like it stands alone outside of any kind of continuity, and that's because it's semi kind of really does. It's incredibly good and surprising and keeps you on your toes and the revelation of three different Jokers was something a lot of people just never expected. But what I think is even better than the three Jokers is the chaotic feeling of not knowing if there were actually three or if there is a definitive Joker until the end of the story. Number 9, Infamous Iron Man. Of all the things to happen to the character of Doctor Doom, becoming the new Iron Man was not at all what I expected. After the events of Secret Wars and reality being brought back to normal, Victor Von Doom was kind of just unsatisfied with his life. He decided to switch his morality and try to serve and help others instead of being a power-seeking villain. Doom took on a bit of a mentor in Tony Stark, whom he'd always actually respected, but when Tony Stark was put into a coma, Doom decided to take his place as the infamous Iron Man, which was a great reason to give us a Doctor Doom in a highly advanced suit of Iron Man's Model Prime Mark 51 armor. The armor was retrofitted into Doom's style, going from the red and gold to the gray, green, and light blue of Doctor Doom, and it's probably my favorite look ever for an Iron Man armor, period. But alongside the capabilities of the Iron Man armor, Doom was still able to access his magical abilities. To make things even better, Doom's intellect and sorcery were near their peaks during this period in time, so he is truly an incredibly powerful hero. One of the ways Doom went about saving the world was using his knowledge of the criminal underworld from when he was a criminal to arrest a large gathering of villains in one big move. These villains were all gathered to figure out what they were going to do now that Doctor Doom has switched sides, and then Doom just busts through the roof and takes down heavy hitters like the Wizard, the Wrecking Crew, and the Hood and Jigsaw all in one go. It's awesome. Number 8, Dark Knight. Batman The Dark Knight Returns came to us originally as a way to give Batman slash Bruce Wayne a fitting end. And it's easily one of the greatest Batman stories out there, with Frank Miller art that was actually understandable and a great tale that wrapped up the character of Batman in a lovely bow. But then Frank Miller went and created two sequels, and the first of which is basically a fever dream of insanity, overly objectified blocky cartoon women, and just really odd visuals, while also taking the character of Superman and completely misunderstanding and disrespecting him. But I think the most egregious moment came when Superman and the third member of the Trinity, Wonder Woman, decided that they were going to hook up right after Batman beat the absolute snot out of the Man of Steel. Wonder Woman comes in to find Superman completely beaten and ranting about how it's all over, and then after punching him for being weak, I guess, they immediately just start making out, and then they fly up into the stratosphere and begin going at it mid-air. Then they slam into the ground, causing volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and tsunamis and hurricane level winds, all for Wonder Woman to say that Superman had moved the earth for her. Wow, so, so cute, so poetic. And then she exclaims that she is now pregnant and they decide to go and get a bite to eat. It's really weird. It's really, really weird. Number seven, Sins Past. Look, I hate talking about this as much as you hate hearing about it, but Marvel did it and I don't think we should forget that. The passing of Gwen Stacy at the hands of the Green Goblin is one of the defining moments in Peter Parker's life, and it cemented Green Goblin as one of Peter's most ruthless foes. Then Marvel and J. Michael Straczynski gave us the Sins Past Spider-Man story arc, and specifically Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1, number 512. Two twin assassins show up in New York on the trail of the Whip Slinger, and to cut to the chase, these twins were actually the secret children of Gwen Stacy and Norman Osborn from when they had an affair, and their birth was suddenly revealed as the whole reason that Norman even took out Gwen in the first place. But the question is, how are these twins around the same age as Peter? Apparently, it's because of Norman's enhanced blood, which caused them to age quicker than normal. Basically, Marvel decided that ruining the image of Gwen Stacy and slightly devaluing her passing was worth it to create an extreme 
extremely overcomplicated arc that goes nowhere and adds nothing but ickiness to the Spider-Man continuity. And then they got retconned. Number six, marriage. The wedding of Batman and Catwoman was a big deal. It was teased at and built up for a long time. Fans were genuinely excited to see it happen and to see what would come next after the fact. A kid of Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne would be awesome. At least it would be awesome, but sadly, the wedding that was so coveted never came to be. Batman issue 50 came and went, and following suit, so did Catwoman. She came and went from Bruce, literally leaving the groom at the altar. Batman was marrying Catwoman so he could actually be happy. And after some convincing words from criminals like the Joker and her friend Holly, Catwoman believed that if Bruce Wayne was happy, then Batman couldn't be Batman. Which one, that's just depressing. But two, both the Joker and Holly, alongside Riddler, Gotham Girl, Flashpoint, Thomas Wayne, Batman, and other villains, were actually working for Bane, who was manipulating events in order to break Batman emotionally and give rise to the City of Bane event. It certainly sent Batman down a path of absolute despair. He became much more drastic with his fighting of criminals, particularly an innocent Mr. Freeze, and he even donned a less advanced version of his bat suit that he would just take more of a beating. It's just sad. Number five, Spider-Man's black suit. Spider-Man's red and blue classic suit is extremely iconic and I don't think anyone thinks that it's bad. The Sam Raimi version of that suit is beautiful, but the black spider suit that appeared in Secret Wars? Whew, that suit was something else. If you tell me that you don't like this one, one, you are a liar, and two, we cannot be friends. This suit was actually designed by a guy called Randy Schuler for a contest that Marvel had and they paid him $220 for it. $220 for one of the most fan beloved Spider-Man suits of all time. $220 for what would eventually become one of Spider-Man's greatest villains and eventually one of Marvel's most popular anti-heroes, Venom. It's the best investment that they ever made. The black symbiote suit was so great and so popular that Marvel even came up with excuses for Peter to get a regular cloth version of the suit made by his girlfriend, Black Cat. That was not a brain-consuming symbiote and just had the benefit of stealth, intimidation, and looking sexy. And at number four today is Bialia. Black Adam does not give a damn. The only things he has shown to care about are himself, his family, and his country. He has ripped someone in half as a warning to not mess with Kondok, which is his country. He has obliterated Psycho Pirate's face for manipulating his own mind, and he took on almost the entire superhuman community in the World War III event. But the whole catalyst for that last one was because he completely decimated the entire innocent population of the country of Bialia. The science squad of Oolong Island, it's a weird name, I know, created the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse for the express purpose of wiping out the Black Marvel family. Now after the passing of Isis and Osiris, Black Adam's direct family, he hunted the Four Horsemen of Apocalypse to take revenge. This brought him to the country of Bialia. Now when he couldn't find the horsemen, his rage and frustration got the better of him and he essentially attacked the whole frickin' country. Adam's rampage ended countless innocent people's existences. It was easily his most terrible act as they had done absolutely nothing wrong and he was just blinded by cold, hard rage. Number three, Marvel. Marvel of the Kree was Marvel Comics' original Captain Marvel, and he was also the first Marvel superhero to permanently pass away when he succumbed to cancer in 1982's The Death of Captain Marvel. That was a huge moment in comic book lore, and he remains to be one of the only heroes to have passed away and not get resurrected. The character has reappeared as visions or in flashbacks and obviously in alternate realities, but he never came back really. One of the coolest and most unexpected ways he did reappear, however, was in the alternate universe which became known as the Cancerverse. It's just a really cool and creative idea. Basically, on his infamous deathbed, the many angled ones contact and corrupt the dying Marvel, granting him new powers which he used to transmute the other heroes, and with Marvel as their lord, they completely took down the Avatar of Death, which in turn completely destroyed Death itself, stopping people from ever actually passing away. This, in turn, 
turn allowed the many angled ones to invade this reality and it became a nightmare. Number two, Invincible Ultimatum. David Anders, aka Dinosaurus, appearing in the Invincible comic book series is an interesting villain. While he does incredibly evil things, he is genuinely trying to save the world and the human race from climate change and the fact that we are destroying our own planet and resources. Following in the logic of the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few, he has done some truly awful things like destroying the entirety of Las Vegas. But still, Invincible saw the good in this villain somehow and he decided to team up with him anyways. Unfortunately, that was a mistake. From Invincible issue 98 to 100, we got an event called The Death of Everyone. Mark had been affected by the Scourge virus and had temporarily lost his powers. Because of this, Dinosaurus took things into his own hands, distracting Invincible and the other heroes with devices in Los Angeles that caused earthquakes. Meanwhile, his real plan was to detonate devices all over Greenland, melting ice and leading to a massive rise in sea level, wiping out thousands of people living in the world's coastal cities. This leads to a massive fight between Mark and Dinosaurus, during the climax of which Dino completely ends Mark by squishing his head till it pops. Now it turns out, the person who Dinosaurus squished and ripped apart was actually a very convincing clone that he swapped out for Invincible mid-fight to make the world think that Mark was hard deleted from life. And finally, in a number one today is Marvel vs. DC. Marvel Comics and DC Comics have for a long time been the two biggest comic book companies that we have, but the 90s were a rough time for comics. To help fight abysmal sales, the two companies staged a crossover. When two entities known as the Brothers, the embodiments of both the Marvel and DC multiverses, remembered each other's existence due to some multiversal and reality based tomfoolery, they pitted combatants from their perspective realities together to decide who was better and who should be destroyed. This gave us the 1996 series called simply DC vs Marvel. Heroes and villains across both universes ended up facing off. Storm faced off against Wonder Woman, Superman fought the Hulk, and for whatever reason, Robin faced off against the X-Men Jubilee. I don't know. DC vs Marvel was shameless fan service and no one cared because it was awesome. Sure, it wasn't particularly that well written or drawn, but whatever. As a solution to the conflict, the Living Tribunal from Marvel and the Spectre from DC joined forces and combined the two universes together, creating the Amalgam Universe. A universe that had its own unique history and was a combination of both DC and Marvel with mashed together characters like Dark Claw. A crossover like this hadn't happened before and it probably won't ever happen again, but I for one am just glad that it happened at all. Number 10, Jason Todd's Worst Fear. Probably one of the most heartbreaking moments for me in recent years in terms of DC Comics happened during Three Jokers, Batman Three Jokers, so pretty recently. I'm still not really sure why people don't like this comic. I thought the story by Jeff Johns and artist Jason Favick was well worth the multi-year wait myself. It was suspenseful, it was mysterious, and it was just stunning. And honestly, every time I go back to it, I find something new that I like about it. Sure, the middle act in issue number two lagged a bit, but otherwise this comic to me was pretty flawless, other than a few minor plot hole issues in my opinion. Also the raccoon. Ah! And despite the leg in issue number two, it still had one of the most heartbreaking moments for me, which occurred when Jason as Red Hood chose to strike out on his own and ended up finding a pool filled with failed attempts at creating the next Joker, which in and of itself is another kind of brutal. At one point, the three Jokers imply that Jason actually might be the best candidate to become the next Joker, but decide that he's simply not smart enough to take up the mantle. Ouch. Instead, they once more beat him to within an inch of his life with a crowbar with one of the Jokers implied to be the Joker who first did this to Jason way back when, commenting on how the second time was even more fun than the first. It gets especially brutal and heart wrenching when Batgirl and Batman arrive on the scene to rescue him and he lashes out at them. Especially when like Babs just comes in and gives him a hug and she's like I just want to make sure you're safe. Number 9 The Dark Knight Strikes Again Batman The Dark Knight Returns came to us originally as a way to give Batman, Bruce Wayne, a fitting end and it's easily one of the greatest Batman stories out there with Frank Miller art that was actually understandable and a great tale that wrapped up the character of Batman in a lovely little bow. But then Frank Miller went and created two sequels and the first of which is basically a fever dream of insanity, overly objectified blocky cartoon women and just odd visuals while also taking the character of Superman and completely misunderstanding and disrespecting him. But I think the most egregious moment came when Supes and the third member of the Trinity, Wonder Woman, decided they were going to hook up right after Batman and beat the absolute snot out of the Man of 
Steel. Wonder Woman comes in to find Superman completely beaten and bloody and ranting about how it's all over and then after punching him for being weak I guess, they immediately start making out. Then they fly up into the stratosphere and begin going at it midair and then slamming into the ground causing volcanic eruptions, massive earthquakes and tsunamis, hurricane level winds, all for Wonder Woman to say he moved the earth for her. Wow, so poetic. And then she exclaims she is pregnant now and they decide to get a bite to eat, but they sure are heroic. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. Helps us out, helps you to stay in the know. It's a win win. Click the subscribe button. Do it! God! Number eight, Jason Todd loves Barbara Gordon. Another really brutal moment, possibly one of my least favorite parts I think of Three Jokers comes at the end. After taking Jason in and helping him to recover after he was attacked, Jason at one point attempts to kiss Barbara. This kind of makes a little bit of sense because you know they've got shared trauma but this felt weirdly forced still and out of place to me because you know Babs still seems like she's kind of trying to be there for Jason like a sister. Like I get that Jason is reaching out because for years he's felt like he was left behind, abandoned and you know like I said they do have shared trauma but Babs and Jason's relationship has always felt more platonic to me. And if anything, more than that, more familial. Like they were truly, you know, brother and sister. And when Babs reaches out, it's very clear she's coming from this place. And yet Jason seems to struggle to read the room and acts on his romantic feelings anyways, if that's even what's really going on for him. Honestly, I think it's, he's just confused. The third issue ends with a kind of weird note with Jason leaves on our apartment door and that ends up falling off and then being swept away by the building's janitor, which is especially weird and kind of cringe because it seems to imply like that whole sequence of shots that if Babs found it things may have been different between them. Um, other than Barbara having to once more reaffirm her boundaries with Jason, I don't see how it could have ended otherwise. What a strange romance subplot that I never expected nor ever really wanted. But hey, there it is. Number seven, Jericho versus Vigilante. Okay, so I did talk about this one for brutal villain defeats, but I had no idea this moment happened before, so if we're talking about brutal DC moments we never saw coming, this one for sure hits the mark for me. Joey Wilson, aka Jericho, is the son of the infamous assassin Deathstroke the Destroyer. But despite that fact, Jericho made almost every effort to be a hero, and he was one. He was even a member of the Teen Titans. The team that consistently stands against his own dad. Now Jericho has the ability, granted to him by the same method that granted his dad his abilities, to transfer his consciousness into the body of another using eye contact and take control of them, effectively possessing them. And it was pretty powerful. He could control some pretty strong beings. Unfortunately, every time he did this, a small shred of the individual psyche remained in his head. At first, it was nothing that he couldn't deal with, just one or two psyches. But over time, possessing multiple people, he had so many psyches floating through his head that it drove him insane. Now the rogue anti-hero known as Vigilante took on the responsibility of stopping Jericho. And where Vigilante originally planned to just go the quick route and completely end Jericho, Jericho's sister stood firm that her brother was a good person at heart and should not lose his life. Vigilante heard her out and decided to not deal with this threat in a lethal way. Instead, after Jericho was captured and in the back of a police vehicle, Vigilante paid the guy a visit and just completely took Jericho's eyes from his head. It eliminated the threat of Jericho's powers, sure, but I can probably think of a dozen different ways that this course of action could have been averted. Number six, Joker's payback. Seriously? The Joker? I mean, what is wrong with this guy? Another horrible moment that haunts me. In fact, this whole story haunts me, not just this one moment, which comes from Brian Azzarello's The Joker. This story follows Johnny Frost, who was tasked with going to pick up the Joker after he's been released from prison. Finally out of the clink, Joker returns to check up on some old friends and old businesses. One of his first stops is a bar and business where Harley Quinn has been dancing while he was away. Not appreciating that Harley has gotten involved in this kind of business, Joker decides to take it out on the man running the establishment by skinning him alive, much to Frost's horror. Although to be honest, this is really only the beginning and things only get much, much worse from there, especially from Johnny's perspective. Number five, abandoned at the altar. The wedding of Batman and Catwoman was a big freaking deal. It was teased at and built up for a long time. Fans were genuinely excited to see it happen and to see what could come next after the fact. A kid of Selena Kyle and Bruce Wayne, what would that be like? 
We've seen futures where they end up together, but sadly, the wedding that was so coveted never came to be. Batman issue 50 came and went, and following suit, so did Catwoman. Came and went from Bruce's life, literally leaving the groom at the altar. Not like permanently leaving his life, but kind of. Batman was marrying Catwoman so he could literally be happy, and after some convincing words from criminals like the Joker and her friend Holly, Catwoman believed that if Bruce Wayne was happy, then Batman couldn't be Batman. Which, one, that's depressing as hell, but two, both the Joker and Holly, alongside Riddler, Gotham Girl, Flashpoint, Thomas Wayne, Batman, and other villains were working for Bane, who was manipulating events in order to break Batman emotionally and give rise to the City of Bane event. Well, it certainly sent Batman down a path of absolute despair. He became much more drastic with his fighting of criminals, particularly an innocent Mr. Freeze, and he even donned a less advanced version of his bat suit so that he would take more of a beating. Like, come on! Guy's been through enough. Number four, the non canonical made canon. One of the weirdest things with DC is how sometimes they just completely leave their stories open to being canon or not, kind of depending on how they're received by fans. And one of the weirdest incidents of this happening is with The Killing Joke. The Killing Joke, written by Alan Moore, was never intended by him to be part of the main continuity. And as far as I know, it kind of isn't really, except for one part of the story the attack on Barbara Gordon, the pain she suffered, and the result of that attack, her becoming paralyzed from the waist down. Why this was the only thing we chose to keep from this story, I do not know. But the whole idea of it just feels super weird, especially when you consider how brutal and graphic this attack was, where Barbara gets no opportunity to defend herself, having been surprised by the Joker's visit while visiting her dad in her civilian form. This element of the story would change Barbara's life forever. And although I do like Babs as Oracle, and I feel like we're able to actually at least turn it is something good. It feels like she was kind of robbed of, you know, some agency here. Especially when you consider the story was never really intended to be incorporated into the canon. And it also still kind of wasn't. Number three, Maxwell Lord and Ted Cord. I made a rhyme. I think we can all agree that it's incredibly rare to see a mainline superhero taken out of the picture. And if it does happen, it's usually in a huge blaze of glory or an incredibly tragic moment or after a long, momentous battle with cancer in the case of Marvel's Marvel. So, when Ted Cord was erased from existence thanks to a bullet from a barrel at the hands of Maxwell Lord in the Countdown to Infinite Crisis, it kinda sucked. After following Ted the whole book as he struggles for anyone in the Justice League to take him seriously, while he's correctly on the trail of Maxwell and learning of all his misuse of both the Justice League's files, Batman's Brother Eye satellite, and the Omax, you'd expect Cord to come out surviving, having a cathartic moment where he finally gets the League's respect or to make a dent in Lord's plans, but in Instead, he gets snuffed out like a tea light candle that never even begun to make the wax melt. It's abrupt, brutal, and it made me legitimately very sad to read it. Number two, Face Off. One of the most brutal moments that still haunts me to this day, of course, involves the Joker. Because of course he's one of the most twisted and often brutal characters that we have over at DC, I would say. This one comes to us from around the time of Death of the Family. In this story, Joker ended up removing his face in order to reinvent himself. Needless to say, this didn't last forever, but it was a terrifying time. And honestly, I'm not sure how Joker lived after doing this, considering that I'm pretty sure he would have been opening himself up to all kinds of like nasty infections. Despite removing his face, Joker would later recover and somehow reapply said face. Despite the fact that the face was not well stored in between, cause comics I guess. Ugh. Number one, fridged. This DC Comics brutal moment caused the whole coining of a term and changed the way comic books were written going forward. Green Lantern Kyle Rayner came home one day after doing his superhero thing in Green Lantern issue number 54 from 1994 to find his then girlfriend, photojournalist Alexandra DeWitt, had been very savagely stripped of her life at the hands of the villain known as Major Force. But not only did Major Force take Alexandra's life, but for seemingly no reason, he also stuffed her into the couple's fridge. It was incredibly brutal and served only to give Kyle, the male antagonist of the story, the motivation to reach new heights as a hero while her character, who was genuinely likable and could stand on her own, was gone forever. This was a trope in not only comics but media in general that presented viewers and readers with the idea of sacrificing the female love interest for the direct purpose of motivating the male hero, which practically never happened in the reverse. After this comic came out, the trope 
group was finally given a name, Fridging, or Women in Refrigerators, and it changed the way female characters were written in comics for the most part. And it changed the way female characters were written in comics for the most part going forward. Number 10, Wolverine loses his skeleton. During 1993's Fatal Attractions crossover event, the X-Men once again had to go up against their old rival, Magneto. The X-Men got the upper hand in this conflict by using the combined psychic powers of Jean Grey and Professor X to cause Magneto to relive all of his worst memories in order to distract him. Which is already pretty brutal when you consider that Magneto was a prisoner in German death camps in World War II. Wolverine attacks Magneto and gets a good scratch in, which leads the Master of Magnetism to do one of the most disturbing things imaginable to the fuzzy Canadian. He pulls out Wolverine's metal skeleton, leaving him a twisted heap of adamantium as the X-Men can only look on in horror. It's a brutal moment, but it doesn't really fit the never saw it coming side of this. I mean, he's a guy with metal bones fighting a guy named Magneto. If anything, I'm surprised this doesn't happen more often. Number nine, Sentry versus Ares. When Norman Osborn set his sights on conquering Asgard, he tricked the god of war Ares into helping him do it. As the battle raged on, Ares discovered that he had been tricked and turned on Osborn, vowing to destroy him. Unfortunately, Norman had the Sentry with him. Worst still, this version of Sentry had given in to the darker urges of his void self. Ares did his best against Sentry, but the fight ended in a truly brutal fashion, with Sentry ripping Ares in half in a shower of gore and entrails. It's a... Uh... It's a lot, but although you could make the case for it being one of the most graphic Marvel moments, I don't think it checks enough emotional boxes for me to consider it the most brutal by any means. Number eight, Punisher's Steamroller. Frank Castle isn't known for working well with others, but if there's anyone you'd think he'd get along with, it would be Wolverine. They teamed up in Punisher, volume six, number 17, and it quickly went off the rails with them being swarmed by a gang of little people People who wanted to cut off their legs in order to make them short. In order to get Wolverine into a fit of berserker rage, Frank makes fun of Logan's height, causing Wolverine to go after him. Wolverine calmed down, but Punisher decided that he was slowing him down and blasted Wolvie's legs apart. After taking care of the gang of little people, Frank decides that the best way to keep Wolverine from coming after him is to run him over with a steamroller. Wolverine will obviously heal, so it doesn't have long-term consequences, but it's still a pretty rough move on Frank's part. Number seven, Alpha Flight versus Michael Pointer. During the events of M-Day, a mutant named Michael Pointer was taken over by an evil being called the Collective, who used him to destroy an Alaskan town. S.H.I.E.L.D. sent in a couple fighter jets to keep an eye on the situation, but they were promptly destroyed and the Collective made his way into Canada. Now, keep in mind, this is a list of brutal moments for me. So imagine my excitement reading an Avengers issue where my favorite superhero team, Alpha Flight, shows up to try and reason with the villain. Now imagine my horror when the S.H.I.E.L.D. agent's command center suddenly loses contact and the next thing I saw was the entire team's twisted and mangled corpses. These guys had their own 130 issue series for years, so it's not like they're just nobodies, and now they were suddenly just dead. Now I get that not many people like the team as much as I do. So for perspective, imagine if your favorite team was the Fantastic Four and they were horribly mutilated off panel. Oh, poor Guardian. That's like the fifth time he's died. I think that what makes this such a brutal moment for me, beyond my personal attachment to the characters, is that it is so quick and off panel, leaving us to imagine what horrible things were done to leave such a terrified looking gory mess of Canada's super team. Number six, Rick Jones's fate worse than death. Immortal Hulk is a cosmic horror series with plenty of brutal moments with characters constantly getting eviscerated and transformed into creatures that are pure nightmare fuel. You could make the case for Banner, Absorbing Man, or any of the Hulks earning this spot, but no one quite got as brutal a fate as Hulk's old friend Rick Jones. When the Shadow Base wanted to go after the Hulk, they combined the deceased Rick's body with that of the Abomination, causing Rick to 
transform into a bizarre and terrifying creature with two of Rick's faces and hands growing out of his head, which would vomit acid at the Hulk while Rick begged for help. He was eventually removed from this abomination, but a few issues later, he was once again fused with a gamma mutate, this time Del Fry, leaving Rick a twisted co-joined mess with Rick's screaming head being the arm of a glowing green skeleton creature. Number 5. Carnage USA One of Spider-Man's most brutal and sadistic villains is Carnage. He is a serial murderer named Cletus Cassidy who bonded with a symbiote and became an even more dangerous and twisted villain. He has had a lot of brutal moments over the years, such as his actions in Maximum Carnage and Deadpool vs Carnage, but my preference is for the miniseries Carnage USA. In this story, Carnage goes to a small town and sneaks into a meatpacking plant in order to eat an entire herd of cattle so that he can get strong enough to take over the town. He sends the symbiote in through the water pipes and takes over men, women, and children, forcing them to attack each other and holding a few of them hostage for and amusement. There are some brutal Cletus moments, such as sending a woman out to collect her husband's head in order to secure the safety of her children, but my favorite and most twisted is when he gathers all of the survivors in a church, hands out a bunch of pliers, and demands they pull out their own teeth in exchange for his mercy. Number 4. Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe Again In Deadpool Kills the Marvel Universe, Deadpool became aware of his status as a fictional character and lost his mind, going on a brutal kill streak that resulted in all the Marvel heroes and villains getting dispatched in cruel and unusual ways. A few years later in the sequel, we got to see a Deadpool from another world do the same thing. On this earth, Deadpool is put under mind control by the villains of the Marvel Universe and tricked into going after his friends. What makes it even more disturbing than the first for me was the fact that while he's attacking the heroes, he is living a fantasy in his head that makes him think Think that he is going on lighthearted adventures with his friends. This is especially true of his encounter with Spider-Man while bonded with the Venom symbiote. In his mind, Deadpool and Spidey are entered into a pie-eating contest against the Blob in order to win money for charity. In reality, he's actually feasting on Spider-Man's brains. It's more brutal due to the lack of agency he's given in his story and the devastating consequences that it holds. Number 3. The Ultimatum Wave The Marvel Ultimate Universe was a wild ride. It gave us Miles Morales, as well as the romance between Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, so it makes sense that they would also give us some of the most bizarre and extreme Marvel stories. In Ultimatum, Magneto has been driven mad at the loss of his children and decides that rather than destroying humanity to make the world safe for mutants, he's just gonna kill everyone. He uses a doomsday device and his powers to shift the world off of its axis causing natural disasters all over the globe. Much of Europe, including all of Latveria, is frozen under a layer of ice, and New York is hit by a massive tidal wave. Millions of people all over the world die in the attack, including Nightcrawler and Hank McCoy. Magneto then sends out more of his minions to destroy the heroes, causing the brutal deaths of several more heroes, including Hank Pym, Doctor Strange, and Thor, just to name a few. Professor X gets personally murdered by Magneto, who later has his face blasted off by Cyclops, who then gets assassinated at an anti-mutant rally. It is a relentless story, but I think the most brutal moment is when Pym finds his wife Janet being eaten by the Blob and responds by entering his giant form, picking up the Blob, and biting his head off. Number 2. Marvel Zombies Marvel Zombies is pretty self-explanatory. It takes place on an alternate Earth where the heroes of the Marvel Universe have been infected with a zombie virus. They retain much of their intelligence and personality, but they are so consumed with hunger that they are willing to go to any lengths to get to their next meal. There is something so brutal about watching all of your favorite heroes hunt down Magneto and brutally and graphically eat him in the open opening pages, and it only gets more disturbing 
going from there. I'd say that the most brutal moment in this story is the revelation that Hank Pym has been keeping T'Challa sedated but alive in a lab and he has been removing his limbs one by one to eat. It's a brutal and disgusting story that you can't help but have fun reading. Number 1. Spider-Man's Take on September 11th There are way more gory and graphic Marvel moments on this list, but the fact that this comic features the real life tragedy of September 11th, 2001 makes it hard to justify putting it lower on the list. Like, I can't sit here and say that a fictional tidal wave was worse than this. Anyways, this issue of Amazing Spider-Man was released a month after the tragedy and opens with Spider-Man surveying the devastation as civilians ask him why he didn't stop the attack. The book is kind of a mixed bag with the benefit of hindsight with devastating moments like a little boy lost in the rubble looking for his dad, but also features moments like Doctor Doom crying at the sight of the devastation as if he hasn't tried to do this exact same thing multiple times. I have mixed feelings about whether this book should have been made so soon after the real life events, but wherever you land, it's hard not to describe the events depicted as pretty brutal. Hi, I'm Juliana, and my favorite Spider-Man is actually our first topic of conversation for today. He's like me, the new kid on the block and one of those characters that no matter where this kid exists in any universe, he suffers. We're looking at Miles Morales. Has this kid suffered enough? No. I mean, in the first film, his uncle turned out to be a pretty big criminal and then died, but it gets worse, don't worry. Pretty shortly after discovering he was never even supposed to be a Spider-Man, that he's actually just a mistake in the timeline, Miles gets thrown into a parallel universe in which the Miles there is a villain that may or may not want to kill good Miles' dad or maybe even him. Follow that? If you want answers, I do apologize, but this was kind of a plot twist that makes the audience suffer as much as the character. It's a cliffhanger that we have to wait until later this year to be resolved. That's the hero movie release I'm most excited for, but let us know in the comments which one you're looking forward to. Speaking of villains, this next point is about a character whose origin was changed to make her just kind of that. Although, you know, she was a hero to start with, at least so we thought. Donna Troy is typically known to be the kid sister of Wonder Woman, often seen as her good friend and confidant. Someone whom Diana can trust, who either grew up with the Amazons since the beginning, or who was adopted by them at a young age. This is why it was so surprising when it was revealed that she was created as part of a plot of Darano's to get revenge on her ex, Hippolyta, by having Donna become Hippolyta's heir instead of the intended Princess Diana, aka Wonder Woman. Yeah, Darano had it out for Hippolyta because, well, she lost her youth and then Hippolyta left her and she was just basically like, girl, why'd you leave me like that? Of course, this origin would once again later be changed for Donna, reverting Donna back to an infant from Man's World whom Diana saved from a burning building. Which honestly, I gotta say, I kinda like better because otherwise, poor Donna. Nick Fury's reveal in Captain America The Winter Soldier is one of my personal favorite MCU twists. Pretty earlier on in the film, we the audience find out that S.H.I.E.L.D., the main intelligence organization in the MCU, is corrupt. That's not the plot twist. That comes when the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury, gets shot in Captain America's apartment. He is actually a good guy, he was just trying to warn Cap about the corruption. He succeeded, but at what cost? He was shot by the Winter Soldier and later died in surgery, or so we thought. Nick Fury is always 200 steps ahead and of course planned it all out. He used a substance that slowed his heart to one beat per minute so he could die and then hide away in a safe house until it was time for him to help save the day again. This next character has also come back from the dead before, but we aren't talking about death of Superman this time around, although that was also pretty surprising I think for people. Superman is an iconic hero in the comics, not just when it comes to his appearance, but also honestly when it comes to his power set. We all know what he looks like and we know what his power set is, right? Well, we think we do anyway. There was a period in the comics where Superman had a completely different look. The look was so different and caught so many people off guard that it was honestly quite short lived. Yep, we're talking about Superman Blue and of course, later Superman Red. This is when Superman got energy based powers and we learned that he'd split into two different beings, with Superman Blue being more cerebral and Superman Red being more a man of action. And if you're wondering if I'm talking about the first time this happened in the classic comics, no, I'm talking about the 90s. As Superman's 60th anniversary was coming up, DC apparently wanted to do something different with the character, which is in part why we got this very drastic redesign for him. It was so polarizing that it lasted not even a full year, and the reasoning for the two Supermen rejoining was left uh, kind of vague. 
Nick Fury has a talent for making audiences jaws drop. Just half a decade ago, he shocked MCU lovers after not being in Spider-Man Far From Home. Throughout the film, Nick Fury is a pretty important guy. He recruited Spider-Man to fight the Elementals, later revealed to be another MCU plot twist, and had a pretty iconic line about space. Q gasps when in a post credit scene, it was revealed that Fury was never actually on the scene. Turns out, he wasn't even on Earth. Instead, he was up in space commanding a group of scrolls. But he was still involved with Spidey telling the fake scroll Fury down here what to do. This reveal was especially shocking because at this point fans didn't know how long Nick Fury wasn't really Nick Fury or if Nick Fury was ever coming back down to Earth. Personally, after everything this man has been through, a bit of vacation time is deserved. You know who else deserves a break? Batman. Batman very rarely gets close to getting his happy ending in the comics. I assume this is because in comics we think that heroes can't be happy and still be interesting. I'm looking at you, Dan Didio. I don't necessarily think that that's true myself, but I will say there does always need to be an element of drama at play. In this case, however, Batman ended up with both. No happy ending and honestly, a ton of drama. Bruce Wayne had met and fallen in love with prominent socialite and kind of world leader Jezebel Jett. For a while, the two dated and it seemed like things were getting pretty serious, honestly. However, just when it looked like Bruce might actually pop the question or even reveal the truth that, you know, he was Batman, Jezebel revealed her cards and we learned that she had been working in secret all along for the Black Glove and was plotting to basically help kill Batman. Of course, good luck getting the jump on the Dark Knight though. He revealed much to also readers surprise, at least to my surprise, that he he had known about her true allegiances all along and her plans, and it was actually she who had been playing into his hand, apparently. Although if you knew all along, Bruce, why'd you even get with her? I don't understand. I guess, hey, you know, the best way to beat a criminal is to date a criminal. Now I won't leave you hanging over here, I did just briefly mention another Spider-Man plot twist, and that is the subject of the Elementals. These were massive, extremely destructive monsters made of, you guessed it, natural elements. Think like if a tornado or a volcanic eruption was sentient, yeah, it was, it was bad. These things destroyed part of Mexico and Europe, so they had all the makings to be a villain that our teenage Spider-Man might need some help defeating. Enter Mysterio. We all wanted him to be a good guy, but no. Oh, turns out the elementals were fake! They were illusions created by Mysterio using drones to project scary images and wreak havoc. This entire thing might have come as an extra shock to comic lovers because the elementals actually do exist in the comics, though their reign was long before Spider-Man's time. Still, it would have been perfectly reasonable for them to make an iconic comeback for the film. As for Mysterio's reasoning, well, former boss Tony Stark, Iron Man, you may have heard of him, called Mysterio's life work at Stark Industries a silly name, and from that point on, he decided to ruin Tony's legacy. At one point, he was just a regular scientist, though. If you thought the reveal of Mysterio was wild, just wait till you hear about this next one. Batman stories are full of twists and turns, and some of them are better than others. Initially, I'd say I felt pretty mixed about this one, but in the end, it did bring me around. We're talking about the reveal that Damian Wayne was the son of Bruce and Talia. It was a shocking reveal, that's for sure, for readers and for, honestly, Batman himself, who was only made aware of Damian's existence after he was dropped on Bruce's doorstep by Talia. At that point as well, Damian was already a young child, so this was a secret Talia had been keeping from him for apparently years. There's also the whole issue of how exactly Damien was conceived, with Grant Morrison rewriting the no longer considered canon encounter and offspring the two had in Son of the Demon. Like I said, I like the Son of the Demon version of that, that story better, but yeah, I, I've come to accept Damien, so that's where I'm at. We've had betrayals across the board today, but none had cut an audience quite as deep as when Captain America uttered the words, Hail Hydra. If you were a Marvel fan on the internet in May of 2016, that was probably a big day for you. Making the rounds on social media was a single comic panel, Captain America saying Hail Hydra. Shocking, because one thing about Cap, he hates Hydra, would fight any member of Hydra, no questions asked kind of vibe. Plus, Hydra is a criminal organization, generally not liked. 
Fans were heartbroken and confused to say the least, many even vowing to ignore this comet set until it all blows over. To those who maybe couldn't stomach the read, don't worry, this Cap isn't the one we know. He was actually a Cap raised in an alternate timeline, he played the part of Captain America in the universe we are used to, but when our good Captain returned, he put an end to his terror. This final point was a betrayal on my eyes. Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver are two heroes that we are used to seeing team up together. Initially in the comics, they're sister-brother twins that started off as villains, working alongside Magneto and his brotherhood of evil mutants, after they found themselves indebted to the master villain. However, over time, they would learn the error of their ways and both end up as team members of the Avengers, working more in a heroic capacity together. Being siblings, they both obviously care deeply for one another. and. And in one reality, uh, this sibling affection went even further than we're used to. If you know, then you know. And for those who don't know, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm talking about the Ultimates comic line in Universe or 1610, where the two of these heroes and siblings ended up together romantically as well. A twist that none of us were expecting and that none of us really asked for. But there it is. We got it anyways. Number 10, Black Mask. Black Mask was killed by Selena Kyle, aka Catwoman. She shot Black Mask point blank, killing him as revenge for what he'd done to those she loved and cared for, chiefly burning down a building in Selena's hood on the east side, which she was trying to help and was kind of under protection, and for hurting her sister Maggie in an irreparable way and basically driving her insane. However, surprisingly, this would not be the end of Black Mask. Black Mask would return as a Black Lantern during the Blackest Night event and would eventually even return to life, surprising many folks, Selena included. But I mean, Black Mask is so great. How can you how can you just let that villain go? You can't. Unless it's Birds of Prey. And then he's probably gone forever in the DCEU. Number 9, Mr. Sinister. One of the weirdest comebacks was when Mr. Sinister created a fail safe in the case of his death, which did inevitably happen. Sinister basically intended to come back via the mutant youth he had once experimented on, who were now all grown up. When this failed, he planned a backup for that backup. Claudine Ranko became Miss Sinister, but but as startling as that transformation was, we were even more startled when Mr. Sinister suddenly returned through her, basically bursting out of her Miss Sinister form, overriding even his Miss Sinister, part Claudine, part Sinister self, and coming back entirely, at least for a few pages, until he could find a more permanent solution later on, when he would fully return via a clone. Also, he literally burst out of Miss Sinister, like literally it was like, pop, here I am. It was weird and creepy and definitely super memorable. I know I found it shocking. I don't know if you found it shocking, but I did. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving our channel here on Top 10 Nerd, please please go check us out over on Facebook where we also have cool stuff and we're also going to be having some exclusive things coming your way. In fact, at the time that this goes up, I think there will already be something super exclusive over there. You won't want to miss it, so make sure you are following us there as well. Number 8, Kite Man. Kite Man is often relegated to the C-list villains in the DC Universe. He's often considered one of Batman's lamest villains and yet via the Harley Quinn animated series, he saw a revitalization of his character, with him even getting a solid fan base due to how he was depicted in the show. I love when things like this happen to C-listers like Kite Man or Polka Dot Man, a lot of mans out there, or even characters like Peacemaker. Not not a man, just, uh, well he is a man, but isn't a man at the end of his name. All of these characters are lesser known and even less appreciated usually, but honestly, they all deserve to be hyped for certain reasons. I love characters that are C-listers, in case you didn't know. Kite Man, while an all around good guy in the animated series, is still considered to be a villain in that animated universe, albeit still a C-list one. And yet this is what makes us love him so much. The fact that he is working hard to try and make a name for himself is kind of a huge part of why I think people just love him. That and the fact that he seems fairly comfortable with who he is, even though he isn't necessarily a top tier villain. And you know, he does know it. It doesn't mean that he doesn't try, and it doesn't mean that he is ashamed of who he is or his, you know, his kite gimmick. He, he rocks it. Hell yeah, kite man. Hell yeah. Number 7, Kang the Conqueror. Kang the Conqueror is a staple villain when it comes to the Avengers team, but even still, he's not the first villain I think of when it comes to threats the Avengers might face in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. He's kind of a weird villain, and he's got a floating chair. It's 
weird. This is all part of the reason why I was surprised to hear that he was getting a revival sort of via the MCU, where he'd appear as a villain in Quantum Mania. Although even from that point on, I was one of the people speculating that his role in the MCU might be larger than just the Ant-Man and the Wasp film he was slated to star in. Especially when we heard that Jonathan Majors was going to be playing him, I was like, okay. You don't just do that and then make it like a one movie like blip of a villain. And so far it would seem to many others surprise, I and some others may have been right when it came to our speculation on Kang's role. An alternate version of Kang appeared in Loki known as He Who Remains. This version of Kang warned of many different versions of himself that were basically being held back due to his maintenance and pruning of the sacred timeline. He also warned that killing him would actually cause the timeline to splinter, allowing all these Kangs to have free roam of the multiverse where many of them were not as chill as he was. And yeah, I don't think they're gonna be as chill. Kang the Conqueror, here we go. Number six, Pariah. Pariah recently made a surprising comeback in the comics when he destroyed all of the Justice League, or well, like almost all of the Justice League. You've heard of the recent story, Death of the Justice League. Well, yeah, that was Pariah. Although Pariah was once a scientist and fairly good man, he was driven mad when he learned that the multiverse was ending during the lead up to to crisis on infinite earths, way back in the day. He tried to warn people that it was coming, but people did not want to listen to him. Now once more, he's in a similar position. In a desperate attempt to prevent another crisis from cyclically destroying everything, this time Dark Crisis, he decided to kill all the heroes, believing that in doing so he would basically prevent the cycle from continuing that would lead to the destruction of the multiverse. It's a pretty crazy idea, but at this point, Pariah is a pretty crazy guy. Although it may makes sense that he would be part of the catalyst for another crisis, DC fans were still surprised to see him return once more in modern comics. I think we were also all surprised that there's going to be another crisis, considering the last one was called Final Crisis. Not so final, it turns out. Number 5, Inheritors. A whole group of villains that I think everyone was fairly surprised to see return again were the Inheritors. This is because the Inheritors were firmly defeated in the previous Spider-Verse event. However, because Spider-Verse was such a massive success, Marvel decided to let the inheritors return for the next one, Spider Geddon. And we still have another third chapter of this continuous event headed our way, said to be the end of the Spider Verse trilogy, that will be known as, aptly, the end of the Spider Verse. At least until we decide to, you know, open that Spider Verse back up again, because, you know, things end, things are final, and then not so much. I have no doubt that the Spider Verse will come back eventually. The inheritors are a group of space energy vampires permanently frozen in time when it comes to their style, stuck in sort of the gothic Victorian era. I love it, but not everybody is here for it. They were defeated and killed at the end of Spider-Verse, but miraculously came back via superior Spider-Man's tech when he decided to combine their DNA to basically make a clone body for himself should he perish. Using his tech, all the inheritors were able to return as clones themselves, causing all the spider totems across the multiverse to rejoin once more during Spider-Geddon to take them out again. And then they became little baby versions of themselves, <laughs> which I love. And also I feel like the inheritors Baby inheritors should get their own book. I said it. Number four, Flashpoint Joker. The Flashpoint version of Joker is actually Bruce Wayne's mother, Martha Wayne. In the Flashpoint continuity, young Bruce is the one who perished during the mugging, as opposed to his parents. Suffering greatly from the loss of their young son, Thomas turned to the path of vengeance, whereas Martha became extremely depressed and ultimately lost her mind, turning to the path of chaos. In the Flashpoint reality and timeline, Thomas becomes Batman and Martha becomes his Joker. Recently in the comics, during Flashpoint Beyond, Flashpoint Joker has made a surprising return, appearing from within the walls of Arkham Asylum. How she got there? Well, we're gonna have to wait and see. What we do know is that she was the one behind the murders of influential characters from the Flashpoint universe. The last we saw a Flashpoint Joker, Martha died drowning in a river, sacrificing herself after learning that in the main continuity, the Joker was the main nemesis to Batman, who in that reality, of course, was Bruce Wayne, her son, who was alive in that reality. The Flashpoint continuity was reset, though, recently with Thomas Wayne's Batman remembering everything that happened previously and trying to solve the mystery of how it all reset and also solve the mystery of you know why all these flashpoint people were dying turned out it was Martha in the walls of Arkham for some reason 
We don't know why. Number three, Cassandra Nova. Cassandra Nova recently made a comeback in the Marauders series, a surprising one too, when she was needed to help solve a mutant mystery revolving around the existence of the very first mutants, hidden from the Earth mutant history apparently, and then later was invited to join the Marauders team by team leader Captain Kate Pride. A lot of mysteries needing to be solved, and a lot of surprising villain comebacks in relation to those mysteries. At first, I wasn't just startled to see Cassandra Nova, I was downright confused, but I gotta say, over the last few issues, her return has grown on me, and I'm kind of here for it. I never would have expected to see Cassandra Nova return, definitely not in a heroic sense either, not with a hero team. Krakoa may be for all mutants, but some wouldn't even consider Cassandra to be a mutant, at least not in the traditional sense because she's a mumma dry, but whatever. She's a mutant, she's she's part of the crew now, I would say. Number two, Gagey. This was one that even caught me by a delightful surprise during the Three Jokers story. While I still am not sure if we know where this story falls in continuity, in or out of continuity, it's still a really awesome read that brought back a villainous sidekick of old that I didn't know how much I really missed until I saw him return. Gagey is Gagsworth A. Gagsworthy, an old school sidekick of the Jokers from way back in the day, back in the 60s, before he was ever with Harley Quinn. In fact, at one point, Gagey also returned to get revenge on Harley for taking his place at Joker's side, but that happened, I believe, during Gotham City Sirens, another cool comeback moment for the gangster. In Three Jokers, however, Gagey returns as one of the Three Jokers' sidekicks. However, his comeback is short-lived, as he ends up being devoured by a Joker shark. R.I.P. Gagey. He he came back and then he died. <laughs> Number one, Rakil. La, 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 la. I don't know how we say this name. It's Skrull, so you know I don't speak Skrull. I'm sorry. Need to learn how to speak Krakoan and Skrull. Got it. Rakil was a really weird comeback, so unexpected that it left everyone who was reading Marvel comics at the time going, "Who? Huh?" What's happening? Who is that? Even I had to look her up myself. Rakil was Empress of the Skrull Empire, who was believed dead for years. When Galactus came to devour the main homeworld of the Skrull at the time, Tarnax 4, Rakil was believed to have perished with it. However, we later learned during the Empire event a few years ago that she had actually survived the death of this world and had been living undercover as the Kree soldier Tanalth the Pursuer. Her return was a major surprise to readers because she had been dead since since the 80s, so before I was even born. So I was like, who dis? I don't know. So unless you'd been reading comics for that long, or you really knew your Fantastic Four comic book history in terms of what went down back then, you were likely confused by her appearance too. Which is alright, because you know what? We got the internet, and we got piles of comics that we can sift through. Although I think all of us collectively, no matter if we were familiar or not with Rakil, were surprised by her return. Even if you did know who she was, you'd be like, wait, what? I thought she was dead. Alright, number 10, Anti-Monitor. During the events of Forever Evil, the crime syndicate of America of Earth 3 invades the prime DC universe, escaping the threat of their complete destruction back on their homeworld. For almost the entire comic event, the CSA all allude to the threat that destroyed their home and just how terrifying it is. The threat itself even makes a cut in the universal barriers just trying to make its way into the prime universe. After the CSA have been defeated, in an awesome fight with Earth's villains, Superman speaks about how the threat they spoke of has to be Darkseid, and he begins preparing for Darkseid's return. But for us readers, we get to learn that the true enemy the CSA were running from was actually the incredibly powerful Anti-Monitor, who had destroyed almost all of Earth-3's reality. It's a cool reveal that leads straight into Darkseid War. Number 9, Ultron. Ultron is a villain that really just pops up over and over as he constantly reinvents himself in different ways. Now, one of his biggest reinventions was when he created an Age of Ultron, which became the name of the 2013 crossover series. Here, he finally achieved his goal of taking over the world. He created machines to hunt down anyone who failed to submit to his rule, with only a small group of heroes surviving and trying to oppose the mad Ultron. He was finally brought down by a program planted in his design by his creator, Hank Pym, after a time-traveling Sue Storm and Wolverine warned Pym of the future threat Ultron would pose. There is also his whole character arc in the MCU's What If animated series as well, which was honestly really, really cool to watch, and I did not expect it to go the way it went. Number 8, Armless Tiger Man. You may be wondering who the heck Armless Tiger Man even is, and you know what? 
That's fair. Honestly, his return is not the only thing we never saw coming because his creation was something I never saw coming. But here we are with a German amputee with pointy ears, sharpened teeth, and enough leg strength to bend steel. He had an incredibly brief career during World War II and was eventually taken out in Wakanda by one of the Howling Commandos. But what was really surprising was when he reappeared in Incredible Hercules number 129 to 131 in 2009. He was among a group of individuals that were the Greek god Pluto's jury of the undead, and they together put Zeus on trial and subdued Herc himself. If you guys are enjoying this video, or you like this channel, make sure you drop a like to let us know that you like what we're giving you. And in at number seven is Superboy Prime. During the massive Dark Knights Metal event, the trinity of Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman go to a collection of three dark multiverse worlds that each have the three main crises from DC Comics happening on repeat. Only each of these worlds' crises are happening differently than they were supposed to. Wonder Woman ended up in the world where the infinite crisis is constantly on repeat. Only in this world, the heroes lost and Wonder Woman is met by Superboy Prime, who hasn't shown up in the DC Universe for quite some time now. Now he isn't entirely a villain, like he definitely has been, but he has always wanted the best outcome, but usually in the worst ways possible. But now, in this death metal event, he fights toe to toe against the Batman who laughs and seemingly destroys him. Or does he? Number 6, Uranus. The Eternal known as Uranus first ever appeared in Marvel What If number 24 in September of 1980, in a story that explained the origins of the Eternals. Now in this story, Uranus is trying to convince his brother Kronos that the Eternals should use their massive amounts of power to take over the world. He believed the Eternals would best fulfill their duties if they exterminated both the Deviants and humans on Earth, all life outside the universe, and then imprison the Celestials. But his brothers Kronos and Oceanus disagreed, sparking the Eternals' civil war. The war culminated in his defeat and banishment to the planet Uranus. Surprise though, this isn't actually what happened. The Uranus, who was banished to another planet, was actually a clone, and the real Uranus was banished to the Exclusion, which is where Thanos and Druig go in the recent Eternals The Heretic story from 2021. Here we are introduced to a very different looking Uranus, who becomes the weapon of Druig against the mutant population in the Judgment Day event. Number 5, Magneto. Speaking of the Judgment Day event, in the X-Men Red comics, the story actually featured a whole Magneto comeback all of its own, which was incredibly awesome, and I think it deserves a mention. Magneto isn't really a full-on villain anymore. He has an incredibly complex moral compass, which makes him more like an anti-hero than anything else. He's a fan favorite, which is why it was incredibly hard to watch him get his heart completely ripped out of his chest by Uranus during Judgment. After Uranus had completely decimated the population living on Mars though, Magneto reveals that he is actually still alive, using his powers to control the iron in his own own blood to keep his blood flowing. He used his power to carry on surviving without a heart. It's completely insane and totally awesome. Number 4, Doctor Doom. In 2009's Fantastic Four number 566, Doctor Doom reveals that he had actually learned everything he knows from one incredibly powerful reality warping villain called the Marquis of Death. Doom also dropped the little tidbit that the Marquis would be showing up. Only when the Marquis did show up with his new apprentice, he was less than happy with the progress Doom had made on Earth, and he attacked. The Marquis warped reality, made Doom think he had won, then snatched the victory away, set him on fire, turned his heart to stone and his blood to acid, then sent him back in time to the Pliocene Age to be eaten by Megalodons. The Marquis goes on to fight the Fantastic Four, almost beating them, and then, when the Marquis is on his last legs, his apprentice shows up and straight up slaps and destroys him, but not before revealing that he is actually Doctor Doom. Doctor Doom survived being eaten by a megalodon, gained enough power and dark magic to completely change his form, he became the Marquis' apprentice again, and even defeated Uatu the Watcher so he wouldn't be discovered. All of that to get his revenge and finally defeat the Marquis of Death. Number 3, Vulcan. We're going back to the X-Men Red story yet again. I'd say I'm sorry, but I 
kind of love this story, so I'm not. How everything happens is still being somewhat explained, but what we do know is that Vulcan is being used as a pawn on a chessboard by Abigail Brand, the director of S.W.O.R.D., which is like S.H.I.E.L.D., but in space. So basically, on the planet Mars is a mutant population called the Iraqi, and they are pretty combat focused. They decide who makes up their governing council with trial by combat. Well, when Vulcan made a play to make it onto that council in issue 3, he was very much defeated. Like, it seemed like he passed away. But it turns out that Abigail Brand either resurrected him through the mutant resurrection protocol or helped heal him. As in issue number 9 of the comic, he shows up out of nowhere again and is essentially challenging the Empress of the Shi'ar Empire, believing himself to still be their emperor like he was all those years back. Number 2, Starro. Sometimes when villains return, they don't always go back to their villainy, and they don't always come back in the way you might expect. The intergalactic conqueror known as Starro has been an enemy of the Justice League for years. He has given them a run for their money many, many times, and since he's been around so long, he has danced around with his morality. Well, Starro was eventually defeated, and he pretty much perished. Sort of. Batman seems to have taken a part of this giant starfish and put it under his care to assist him and the Justice League with its incredible psychic capabilities. This new creation is called Jaro, and he is awesome. Starro himself isn't actually completely gone, as we find out a bit later, but Jaro just wants to make his dad, aka Batman, proud. He even dresses up as a Robin to try to be the best Robin ever. It's fantastic. And in at number one, Sinestro. Sinestro is Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps' greatest enemy. He was imprisoned in the central battery on Oa during the events of Emerald Twilight, where Hal Jordan went completely bonkers. In a last ditch effort to defeat him, the Guardians released Sinestro in an attempt to stop Hal Jordan from destroying the Corps, and their battle was brutal. It eventually came down to a bare knuckle fist fight, and Sinestro drove Jordan to go over the edge and snap Sinestro's neck, taking him down permanently. But this is a list of returns. So, in a later retcon, it was revealed that the Sinestro that Jordan snapped was really a light construct and that Sinestro and the Parallax entity were actually the ones responsible for Hal Jordan's descent into villainy. So now, all the Hal Jordan fans can rest assured their hero is still squeaky clean. And honestly, a really cool return for a really awesome villain. Iron Man being revealed as a sleeper agent for Kang was really unexpected because it was about as random as it sounds. How? When? Why? These are all questions that folks had at the time, and not all of them were satisfactorily answered. This was because the story had moments where it even contradicted itself. If you want to check it out at your own peril, of course, you can find it as part of the crossing event. There are moments after the reveal where even Iron Man himself seems to struggle to remember that he is actually one of the bad guys here. It was a twist even he never expected, I imagine. But I guess if you are a sleeper agent, that makes sense. You wouldn't expect it because you never knew that you were evil. It was deep, it was repressed. Technically, he wasn't working for Kang directly, but instead, he had been influenced by Immortus, who is an alternate timeline version of Kang the Conqueror. Not a sleeper agent, but a person we weren't expecting to secretly be a villain, I'll say that much. This next point also involves a hero that wasn't really what he seemed. Although unlike Iron Man, his history as a hero wasn't as established or well known in the comics. He was um, quite a bit more mysterious. So maybe we should have expected this. Baphomet is a hero who ends up befriending Batman, even becoming so trustworthy of an ally that Bruce reveals his true face to Baphomet and even brings him to the Batcave. This ended up being a mistake on Batman's part as Baphomet used this opportunity to drop his disguise so he could attack and kill the woman Bruce loved the most at the time, his fiance, Silver St. Cloud, revealing himself to not truly be the hero Baphomet, but instead the villain Automatopoeia. Another villain plot twist that I know I personally was not expecting comes from the Batman camp. It's uh, pretty twisted though, because Joker this time around doesn't actually target Batman or Gotham, but instead sets his sights on an even more godlike hero, Superman, and his city of Metropolis. What Joker was thinking here, I honestly have no idea. I don't know how he thought he could just like come out of this attack 
if it was successful, especially alive. But you know, maybe that was all part of his plan. Maybe he didn't expect nor want to come out alive. Well, he certainly didn't end up doing that. I'll tell you that much. In the Injustice reality, Joker and Harley Quinn team up to trick Superman into thinking Doomsday has returned. This causes Superman to go into a paranoid rage, fighting against Doomsday, who is later revealed to have been actually Lois, oh no. But Superman was simply made to hallucinate Lois as Doomsday, which is how this all happened. In addition, Joker and Harley use this distraction to blow up Metropolis, causing Superman to kill Joker during his interrogation and renounce his former peaceful ways, becoming a superhero dictator who refuses to tolerate the state of the world any longer, basically forcing it into a totalitarian time of peace. Speaking of destructive villains, Galactus is known for being a destroyer on a much greater scale, I would say, than the Joker. He's a world destroyer, and the last thing I'd ever expect to see him doing is creating life. Hence why this twist involving him was so surprising. It wasn't your typical villain twist either, as it didn't have to do with him tricking someone or devising the end of a planet or a universe. It was actually kind of just the opposite. This Galactus, of course, was an alternate version who was basically forced back into an egg to incubate for longer than he had when he became Galactus, when Galen became Galactus. It was suggested that this was why Galactus was a destroyer, because he basically just wasn't fully cooked when he came into the world, so that's why he ended up being a bad guy. Kind of like a Pandora's box scenario, you know? Like you open Pandora's box and all the bad stuff comes out, but then you close it because you're scared. But really, you should have just kept that open for longer because there was good stuff underneath. The plan worked, and after a little bit of extra time in his egg, Galactus instead emerged not as the world devourer, but instead as the life bringer, a creator of worlds instead of a destroyer and devourer of them. Moving on, Grail recently made a surprising reappearance in the comics. We haven't seen her for a while, and she is one of my favorite Wonder Woman villains. She's the daughter of an Amazon assassin, Mirana, and new god, Darkseid. She's pretty epic. She's basically like the opposite of Wonder Woman. While she is a great Wonder Woman villain, it was pretty cool and unexpected to see her agree to work with other fellow Wonder Woman villains at the behest of the Sovereign and the United States. And if you want to catch more Grail action, you gotta go check out the new Wonder Woman series, Wonder Woman from 2023 by Tom King. It's really good. At least so I hear. I hear it's really good. Everything that I've seen in it looks really good. I gotta add it to my pull list and I gotta catch up and read all of it. Well, Conchu has never particularly been known as the most gracious, kindest, or compassionate of gods. He is usually an ally to Moon Knight. And while Moon Knight isn't always a perfect cookie cutter hero, he is ultimately a hero, except for this time around. That's because Khonshu made Mark into an antagonist when he sought to defeat Mephisto, who he claimed was basically attempting to take over the Earth. So he was like, Mark, you gotta help me, we gotta beat Mephisto, just trust me. The problem was that Khonshu got Mark to gather the Avengers' weapons and items of power, hoping to use them to defeat Mephisto so that he could basically rule Earth himself. Next up, one of my favorite reveals of all time, especially in regards to the MCU, not only because it was fairly unexpected, even as someone who has a pretty good handle on who Agatha Harkness is and what she's capable of, but because it has to be the catchiest villain reveal ever. While we all had many theories for who was the great villain in WandaVision, other than maybe Wanda herself to an extent, other theories were simply just more popular than Agatha being the one behind it all. I mean, we all knew it was probably Agatha Harkness there, we all knew that, but to think that she was the mastermind, not a lot of us were expecting that, to be fair. Agatha, while sometimes a villain, is more well known as an ally in the comics, so for it to be revealed that she was actually the one behind it, that it had been Agatha all along, that caught us by surprise. Over at DC Comics, we have another usually ally who instead was revealed to be a villain. Perhaps not the whole time, but definitely upon his return. Jason Todd was a character that we never expected to see again, so his coming back at all was pretty shocking. For a while there, it was implied that Jason would be Hush, and in fact, that was the initial intention for the Hush reveal in the comics. Fun fact. And this might have been one of the few indications to fans that DC Comics was maybe thinking about planning his return. Jason Todd came back to Batman's world not as a former ally in Robin, but instead as just the opposite, a villain who blamed Batman for the fact that the man who nearly killed him was still on the loose. Of course, that man being the Joker. 
As such, Jason Todd had a different approach to vigilantism once he returned that made him a villain at the start. And you know, more of an anti-hero I'd say as he's evolved. Heroes becoming villains is one thing, but what about when villains become heroes? Or disguising themselves as heroes, at least. When it comes to Spider-Man alternates, we have a lot of them, it's true. But one that I would have never expected to see is a version of Spider-Man who was a straight up villain. Or scratch that, a version of Spider-Man who was just straight up one of his most iconic villains, Dr. Octopus. But that is what we got with this story arc. Doc Ock's body was failing and he managed to convince Peter to visit him before he shuffled off this more coil. However, this of course was a trap and Otto used this opportunity to swap bodies with the young Spider-Man. As a result, Spider-Man's mind ended up in Doc Ock's failing body and Doc Ock's mind ended up in Peter's much younger and powerful one. Surprise, surprise. This was how Dr. Octopus was able to defeat death, but tragically, Spider-Man actually did end up dying here, even more surprising. Or at least he died at the time. His consciousness would actually still live on somewhat as it existed to some extent within his body, and later on, Otto would relinquish Spider-Man's body back to the consciousness of Peter, which was left remaining inside his physical form. Basically got stronger as time went on, and then eventually Otto was like, you know what? Maybe you should just be you, and I'll just be me. We'll just go our separate ways. Superior Spider-Man, out. Not quite as dramatic as a body swap, but still pretty dramatic. I really, really, really love this next one. And I think for many of us, this twist caught us completely by surprise. Might be the most twisty reveal we've ever had. In fact, this twist and character became so iconic that she made her way from the animated universe to the comic book one. Yeah. Have you guessed it yet? Yeah, I'm talking about Andrea Beaumont and the reveal that she was actually the Batman antagonist, Phantasm. Andrea Beaumont was introduced to us as one of Bruce's old flames, who he actually almost ended up settling down with back in the day. She knew Bruce better than most others, which that is also what made it such a great and compelling reveal and twist, because it also then kind of made sense that Phantasm was such a great foil for Batman, because she was someone that knew Bruce so well, so kind of works out, kind of makes sense. Number 10, Joe Fixit and Red She-Hulk slash Red Harpy. For a book that's about a giant green monster that's potentially a vessel for the opposite to God that preys on the nightmares and rage of mankind, Immortal Hulk has a lot of heartfelt moments. Betty Ross and Bruce Banner's relationship is complex. They were so good together at first, but obviously the Hulk makes things complicated and Bruce has a lot of childhood stuff and daddy issues to get through, like a metric butt ton. Eventually, Betty passed away, but she came back and became the Red She-Hulk, and then she fused that persona with that of her Harpy persona that she has become a few times, so that she was the Red Harpy Hulk thing. Well, essentially, in Immortal Hulk issue 48, while Hulk was Joe Fixit, he and Betty as the Red Harpy got it on. She talked about how closed off Bruce is to her compared to the Joe Fixit persona, and even other personas of the Hulk. It's just so weird to me, and it almost feels like this is Betty cheating on Bruce, but it's really just two aspects of Betty and Bruce hooking up together. I don't know if it's cheating or not, but it's certainly strange. Number nine, Miss Marvel and Vision. Captain Marvel and Vision are definitely a couple of the weirdest ones on this list. And we also happen to just be starting out, so it's not a good sign. Back in the day, Carol was not yet known as Captain Marvel, and instead went by the name of Miss Marvel. This was before Kamala Khan came along and took up that mantle for herself after Carol had moved on from it, becoming Captain Marvel. Kamala inherited it, by the way, because she was just a massive Carol Danvers fangirl, which I kind of love. Before those days, however, there was the opposite awkward date that happened between Carol as Miss Marvel and Vision. This was after Vision and Scarlet Witch had broken up, and I gotta say, I don't know who takes the cake for having more awkward dates between them, but in a weird way, it kind of makes sense that they'd get together and have an, an awkward date. Considering that when I think of awkward superhero dates in Marvel Comics, both of these people come to mind for me, for like folks who have had some of the most awkward date moments. Number eight, Nightwing. This one is a little unique, not only because it breaks up a long beloved relationship between Nightwing and his Teen Titans teammate Starfire, but also because the writers of the comics retcon things about multiple characters' histories that made no sense or kind of completely ruined the integrity of said characters. After deciding that Barbara Gordon is the perfect fit for Nightwing over Starfire, the beginning pages of Nightwing Annual Number no. 2 in 2007 gave us Nightwing confessing how absolutely madly in love he is with Barbara. The story then goes on to retcon their entire 
their history, stating that they have been in love since the days when they were Batgirl and Robin, despite the weird age difference. And then, if that weren't weird enough, the book turns Dick Grayson into a cheater. Dick shows up the night before he's supposed to marry Starfire and spends the night with Babs. So he cheats on Corey, but then Dick also gives Babs an invitation to that wedding after just spending the night together, and she wasn't even aware that Dick was still planning to get married in the first place. Weird. Number 7. Red Hood and Batgirl Jason Todd and Barbara Gordon are admittedly a super weird ship. At least, for me. I'm sure there are some of you out there that really love the idea of this couple, but for me, honestly, it's just weird. Granted, this hookup didn't go as far as some others on our list have. Instead of this being a full-on relationship, a one-night stand, or even just a date, this was merely a profession of love from Jason to Babs. Babs, however, took the opportunity to create some boundaries with Jason. She saw he was hurting and wanted to be there for him as someone who also has shared trauma in regards to her relationship with the Joker, and just in terms of of someone who's also a Bat family member, so she's kind of like a sister to him. She felt that this shared experience with the villain was basically clouding Jason's mind somewhat, making him feel closer to her romantically, but without there actually being any other real spark between them or reason for them to be together. And honestly, I gotta say, I agree with Babs on this one. Personally, I like Jason Todd best with Artemis, so I'm here for that ship, but this one, not so much. Number six, Human Torch and Victorious. Okay, so when Doctor Doom was looking for a wifey to become Queen of Latveria and help him rule, he chose Victorious, his most loyal follower and herald. She obviously and gladly said yes, but unbeknownst to Doctor Doom, the night before that happened, Victorious and Johnny Storm, aka the Human Torch, defended Latveria's treasures together and somehow found themselves hooking up after two of Johnny's other hookups, Lyja and his galactic soulmate Sky, who also shares a psychic connection with the Human Torch, both just flew away. So the last person you'd expect Johnny Storm to get with is who he gets with. No one said Johnny Storm was the brightest of the Fantastic Four, so of course Johnny still goes to the wedding between Doctor Doom and Victorious, just hooked up with in Fantastic Four Volume 6 Issue 33. And he just causes problems, like sneaking out at night to try and see her. Victorious totally tells Doom about the entire encounter, but right in the middle of the wedding ceremony. And Doctor Doom, well he responds how you would imagine Doctor Doom would respond to that badly. Number 5. Supergirl and Comet Supergirl and Comet is definitely a weird one. While they really only had a brief potential romance, not even a full on romance, Comet was Supergirl's magical horse. So yeah, I, I think you can see why this one is weird. I don't know if I really need to justify the awkwardness of this. One. Now that being said though, Comet wasn't always a horse. He was accidentally transformed into one. He was actually originally a centaur. I guess that's not that much better. But he was actually going to be turned into a full human. But instead of being turned into a full human, he was accidentally turned into a full horse. Which I guess is an easy error to make when you have a centaur. However, when a certain Comet flew overhead, he would basically get to be human for a day. Which is how he was able to romance Supergirl. Albeit, admittedly, quite briefly. Number 4. Miss Marvel and Marvel. Marcus. In Avengers 197 from 1980, Carol Danvers, back when she was Miss Marvel, discovers that she is pregnant. She doesn't remember how it happened, and that sweet little baby is growing quick. Not three issues later, in Avengers 200, Carol pops the little sucker out within days of even finding out that she was pregnant, and all the Avengers are like weirdly excited about it, as if it's not the weirdest thing that just happened, and they treat Carol like she's the unreasonable one for not being excited. The baby, who has been named Marcus, grows up into adulthood in basically hours and reveals that he is actually the son of Amortis, the ruler of Limbo and one of the different incarnations of Kang the Conqueror. Amortis had Marcus with a woman he had apparently plucked out of the time stream, but Marcus was trapped in Limbo until he could be born on Earth. So Marcus had brought Danvers to Limbo, romanced her with a combination of charm and quote, subtle manipulation from Amortis' machines, and he got Miss Marvel pregnant so that he could be born on Earth as her child. Pow. Number 3. Craven and Queen Goblin I mean, it's hard to top that last one, but we're gonna try. What is even happening here? Okay, I'm gonna be honest. I did think Queen Goblin was an interesting character when she first appeared in the comics. She was originally the therapist Ashley Kafka, or at least a clone of the original Ashley Kafka. With her work, she attempted to help Ben Riley during his time and her time working for Beyond as his therapist, back when he was Spider-Man during the whole Beyond story arc in the Spider-Man comic. However, eventually, the Beyond Corporation would be revealed as being 
surprise, evil, and they would turn Kafka into a villain herself, with her becoming Queen Goblin. Not to be confused with the Goblin Queen, totally different character. And yet this change also resorted in her getting a new villainous bow as well, partnering up with Craven, or at least once again, a clone of Craven who took the place of his original as his pseudo son. That's comics for you. Number two, Gwen Stacy and Norman Osborn. The passing of Gwen Stacy at the hands of the Green Goblin is one of the defining moments in Peter Parker's life, and it cemented Green Goblin as one of Peter's most ruthless foes. But then Marvel and J. Michael Straczynski gave us the Sins Past Spider Man story arc, and specifically Amazing Spider Man Volume 1, number 512. Two twin assassins show up in New York on the trail of the Web Slinger. To cut to the chase, these twins were actually the secret children of Gwen Stacy and frickin' Norman Osborn from when they had an affair, and their birth was suddenly revealed as the whole reason that Norman even offed Gwen in the first place. But Adam, how are these twins around the same age as Peter is? Apparently, it's because of Norman's enhanced blood, which caused them to age quicker than normal. Basically, Marvel decided that ruining the image of Gwen Stacy and slightly devaluing her passing was worth it to create an extremely overcomplicated story arc that goes nowhere and adds nothing but ickiness to the Spider-Man continuity. Gross. Number one, Hulk and She-Hulk. I mean, yeah. While there are other more inappropriate familial relationships in comics, honestly, which is weird, but it's true, this one is still one of the worst out there, and it was even hinted at in the main continuity. That's right, we're not just talking about all realities here, although that also happens with these two. At one point, Hulk basically goes into a crazy rage, and it's revealed that it's kind of because Hulk's like, basically in heat. Also, I think like super depressed and lonely, and so he goes into heat, I don't know. She-Hulk attempts to calm him down, and as a result, he attempts to catch her and mate with her. Fortunately, this doesn't end up happening, but the other messed up part of this whole thing is that a part of Hulk's mating ritual seems to be to like actually cause harm to She-Hulk. I mean, there's messed up, and then there's the Hulk level of messed up, and this is definitely the latter of those. 